A big part of the program of modern evangelism depends upon its doctrine of the sinner's resisting of the Holy Ghost. I want to give you what is usually outlined in gospel preaching today, and I call you to record if it is not an accurate one. In most so-called gospel preaching that has gone on and is going on in our 20th century, God is so presented. And of course, there are elements of truth to it as well as elements of error. But we've heard it so much that we very seldom, if ever, challenge it. God's presented as in love, sending his son to die for sinners. Well, that certainly is true. Uh, but then, uh, in bringing the sinner under the gospel, and to a conviction concerning his sin, this is all that is the office of the Holy Spirit. And then the sinner is told, God has done everything either that he will do or can do. Now it's up to the sinner. If the sinner cooperates with what the Holy Spirit has done, then he goes on to salvation. However, in most gospel preaching, it's made obviously plain that the sinner may, at his own whim and desire, negate all that an omnipotent God has done and say no to the Holy Spirit. And thus all that God would have done is uh, completely goes down the drain as far as that particular sinner is concerned. And this puts the sinner in the driver's seat. And actually, the effect of this type of preaching, and I say we've heard it so much that we seldom if ever challenge it, actually would put God at the mercy of the sinner rather than putting the sinner at the mercy of God. I think we can look out at present-day Christianity, and if we're honest with ourselves, we can say, what has this type of preaching, this emphasis, what has it done? I'll tell you, it's done tremendous harm to the souls of men and to the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to this theory, a matter of our salvation is like a big checker game. God's made all the moves he's going to make. And the next move is the sinner in this checker game of salvation. If the sinner makes it, all is well. If not, then God's purpose is frustrated, and God simply isn't able to save the sinner unless the sinner cooperates in this matter of salvation. Again, I say, this makes God to be at the mercy of the sinner rather than the sinner at the mercy of God. When I think of this, I ask myself, is this really what the Bible presents? For if it is, we'd have to believe it. Is this the everlasting gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Is this representation of the gospel and the presentation of the gospel, is it a fair representation of what we find in the, in the Scriptures? Well, I think as we have gone over the elements of the old gospel, there would be several points at which, from doctrine we have seen to be perfectly scriptural, that some of these concepts could be challenged. And yet this is probably the most important concept in so-called modern evangelism. Let me put it in another way. That means then that according to this, that the electing love of Almighty God the Father could be frustrated and he could fail in that electing love. Some people aren't bothered about that at all, but we who believe in God's electing love, uh, we take that as an affront to our God that what God has purposed the sinner might frustrate, and God might not be able to call into himself those that he has elected to do so. So you have God the Father here, endangered in his purposes, or at least frustrated in them. And then God the Son, having come down, and having given his life for his sheep, as he said, and with the promise, I'll raise him up at the last day, that Christ now may be frustrated in his purpose, and may not be able to redeem those that he gave his life to redeem. And most seriously of all, perhaps, then the work of the Holy Spirit. And this involves the calling of God that we've been considering. That the work of the Holy Spirit then can be completely frustrated and is, after all, dependent upon the will of man and man's choice and man's decision, rather than dependent upon the will of God and God's choice and the operation and that effectual operation of the Spirit of God. I wish we had time to go into all that Paul says in Romans chapter 9. 
But the same apostle wrote that, who wrote Romans chapter 3 and a great deal of the rest of our New Testament. And he said, Now it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Uh, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow, but it's in the book. And even the evangelical gospel of John, when he's in the very context of talking about as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, goes right on in the next sentence and says, which were born not of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now that's quite plain and conclusive. And yet what about this business of resisting the Holy Spirit? For I read it here in Acts chapter 7. There are other verses of Scripture likened to it. And it is an honest question. In what sense then? Uh, may it be said that people may resist the Holy Ghost. Uh, what can the sinner do in relationship to the Holy Spirit's operation? Our two verses that we took as text naturally divide the subject for us. Number one, how it is that man may resist God. And here in the person of the Holy Ghost, I take it for granted that you believe the Holy Ghost to be God. I do. He's not an it or an impersonal force. He is the third person of the Trinity. He's God. Secondly, how it is that a man may not resist God. For I find Paul saying or asking the question, of course, not expecting an answer. The answer is obvious. Who hath resisted his will? And the will there means his intended purpose. Now, before we get into the subject any further, that's just merely a few introductory remarks. There are some general observations about these two verses of Scripture, and we, we will cover others, that I want to make, and I think you ought to be aware of. When Stephen said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. It's interesting to note what the word resist is. Now, often in our English Bibles, uh, what is the same word in the English? When you check it in the original, it's a different word altogether. And when Paul said, Who hath resisted his will, though it's both resist in the English, there are two different words altogether. In the first place, when Stephen said, You do always resist, the word that he used means literally to fall against. You are always falling against the Holy Ghost. The word picture is a, a someone falling against some great object that's moving his way, and in protest he flings himself against it. I might go out here in the street, and a big truck may be coming, and I say, you've got no business coming down my street, I live here, and jump out in the front of that truck and throw myself against it. I am resisting that truck. But I want to ask you, what's going to be the consequence of such resistance? I am falling against the truck. I'm throwing my entire being against it. With all of my determined will, I'm throwing myself against the force of that truck. Of course, obviously, what is going to result is that I'm going to be destroyed. If that truck is stopped at all, it's not because I stopped it. The driver may see me, hit me, throw on the brakes, and may stop, but my throwing myself against it is not going to stop a truck. Stephen said, you'd always throw yourself against the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. And by the way, I call your attention to another fact you ought to know. This is the only place in Scripture this word is used. It's never repeated again. It's found once here and never again in all the Scripture. Now, when the Apostle Paul asked the question, which actually is a statement of fact, and who hath resisted his will? The word there, though it's the same in the English, is this in the original. It means not to throw yourself against, but it means to stand against. Who hath stood against his will? Now the idea here is as a dam stands against the water to contain that water and to hold it back. Who has so stood against and held back the intention and purpose of God? And of course to ask a question like that is to answer it. The answer is obvious. No one has. There is not a force in this universe great enough to stand against God. And if you say that there is, 
be it one man or many men, then you must deify that man and worship him rather than God. And I think when we think about it, as we shall in the course of this message tonight, the reason the Apostle Paul answered the question is to show uh, the obvious impossibility of it. Who has stood against as to contain and impede the will that is the intended purpose of God? No one. Who has thrown themselves against that purpose, thus being destroyed by their so doing? A good many. You do always throw yourself against the purpose of God. Against the Holy Ghost here in particular. The same English word, but in completely different meaning when we come to the original language. And I call your attention to this, that the Holy Ghost gave this in the original language, not in the English. You would always resist the Holy Ghost. You're all the time throwing yourself against the Holy Ghost. But who hath resisted? Who hath stood against so as to prevent or even slow down the intended purpose of God? Well, to answer that question, or to ask it, is to answer it. Now, the important thing here, and by the way, I'd like to say this. Scripture always explains itself if we'll let it. But a lot of people, and I, I'm one of those, I'm reluctant sometimes to let Scripture explain itself. A lot of times I'd rather take my explanation into the Scripture. But this Scripture, like all other Scriptures, should be taken in its context. Notice what it says. Look at it, will you? Ye do always resist, throw yourself against the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Now the obvious question then to ask is, how did their fathers resist the Holy Ghost? For the way their fathers did, they're doing the same thing. We don't have to wonder what he's talking about. Stephen very plainly tells us what he's talking about. Just like your fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, in that same manner you do always resist it, but not in another manner. And he tells us here very plainly how that their fathers did resist the Holy Ghost. He goes on to say, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. And they've even betrayed and murdered the Messiah when he came. And they received the law at the disposition of angels, but they didn't keep it. That's how their fathers threw themselves or resisted the Holy Ghost, and that's how they're resisting it as Stephen is, is speaking to them. All right, how did their fathers then, other than those general statements, how did they? Well, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll find another instance that ties in very naturally with this. We're not stretching the point at all. I think when you read it with me, you'll see how naturally it falls in. It would do you well to read the entire sermon. He gives a brief history of Israel from Abraham all the way down, emphasizing particularly the ministry of Moses. If you've read the seventh chapter in Stephen's sermon, you know that's true. Because Christ was a prophet like unto Moses that was to come. Now Paul, speaking of what's going to be in the latter days, Verse 1, he says, This know also in the latter days perilous times shall come. All right, Paul, what's it going to be like? He says, There are some in verse 7 ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 8, he says, Now as, did you notice that? As, there's a word of likeness. Stephen said, You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. All right, here's the as. Now as, Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses. There's another word, mean to array yourself against something like an army arrayed for, for battle. In other words, they become now the enemies of Moses and what Moses stands for, and they array themselves to do battle against Moses, which they did. They withstood Moses. That is, in another sense, they resisted him. So do these resist what? Look at it. What do they resist? The truth. All right. Did Israel resist the truth? Yes. When they received the law, which was an embodiment of truth, they didn't keep it. They threw themselves against it and did not keep it, 
thus destroying themselves. But let me ask you something. Did they destroy God's law? I think it was Lester Roloff I heard say something that's very true. He said there's no such thing as a person breaking any of God's laws. And that's true. He said many have broken themselves on God's law, but nobody breaks God's law. That is, effectually, that's true. You may throw yourself against it, and like those Jews, you resist the Holy Ghost to your own breaking, but brother, the law is still there, in spite of all that men have done. All right, they resisted the truth. May men resist the truth? Israel resisted the truth. They were given the law at the disposition of angels, and they didn't keep it. They threw themselves against it. You that know your Old Testament, you know that they did. They were stiff-necked and rebellious. Peter said, or Stephen said to him, you're uncircumcised in heart and in ears. My, how they resi resisted the truth. How they resisted the man of God in the person of Moses. And not only Moses, Stephen could ask them, which of the prophets didn't your father stone? How may men resist the truth? They may resist. Or how, they may, how may they resist God or the Holy Ghost? They may resist the truth that is being declared. They may, like Jannies and Jambres, resist the servants of God. They did to Moses. So also do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Well, look what it says in verse 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifested unto men as theirs also was. Brother, God opened up the earth and swallowed this bunch that stood against his truth and stood against God's man. Yes, they threw themselves against God's truth, but did they stand against it? No. Their folly didn't proceed, proceed very long. Though they threw themselves with all of their might and the fury of their will against God's truth, God's man, and God's purpose. That very plainly is how these Israelites resisted the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. He goes through in his message here, and he shows that though they resisted the truth, Though they resisted God's true oracles, look at verse 38, back in uh, Acts chapter 7. This is taken from the sermon he just got through preaching. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness, with the angels which spake to him in Mount Sinai, that is Moses, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Israel received the oracles of God, including the, the law and all the tabernacle and the order of sacrifices. You say, did they resist those oracles? Oh, yes, over and over and over again. They threw themselves against all that God was saying to them, all that God was doing through those oracles, all that God was doing through his messenger. But now let's go back and stay here in chapter 7 just a little bit, and let's look into the context, and let's ask ourselves, did these men, did they frustrate any of God's purpose as they resisted the truth? As they withstood Moses, did they spoil or mess up God's program? As they would not hear the law and the holy oracles of the law, did they mess up God's plan? Well, let's see if they did. Look at uh, verse 6 and 7 of this chapter. Chapter 7 of Acts. God spake on this wise. Now he's declaring his plan. That his seed, that is Abraham's here, should sojourn in a strange land, that is Egypt, that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that, shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Now God said that 400 years before it all came to pass. Now in throwing themselves against God's purpose, did they change this? Were they able to change God's program? Were they able to keep Israel from being in bondage 400 years? That's what God said they were going to be. And did they change the purpose of God? God said, I'm going to bring them out with a mighty hand, and they're going to serve me in this place. That is, where Abraham was a stranger, they're going to own it and serve God there. Now, they always threw themselves against God's truth, but did they change God's plan? Well, look at verse 9. 
And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph. There they were, resisting the Holy Ghost, throwing themselves against the truth of God. Joseph was God's chosen vessel. The brothers got mad at him and sold him into Egypt. What did they do? It? Out of envy. That's sin and hatred. But what did they accomplish by it? Don't you see? They only eventually got Israel down to Egypt where God 400 years had said he was going to put them. Did they mess up God's program? Well, it doesn't look like it yet. Let's go on just a little bit further. Look at verse 14, the same chapter. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down to Egypt and died. Sounds like God's plan's working out pretty well, in spite of all of the resistance of men, doesn't it? God said, I'm going to send you down to Egypt. You're going to be there 400 years. Well, they threw themselves against Joseph. They threw themselves against God. You know the life of Jacob. You know the life of these patriarchs. Some of them very sordid. They were resisting the Holy Ghost. They were throwing themselves against God's truth and God's men. Were they changing God's plan? For Paul said, who hath withstood his will? Well, so far we see obviously or not. Look at verse 17. And when the time of the promise drew nigh. What promise? Well, we read about it. I'll bring you out. After 400 years, I'll bring you out, and you're going to worship me in this place. When the time of the promise drew nigh, which God has Abraham, there's God's will, his purpose, his intention. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt. And then look at verse, uh, let's see, 17 we just read. In which time, verse 20, Moses was born. And here you'll find a little bit further on down that Moses was their deliverer. Look at verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them out, but they understood not. Look at there. They're throwing themselves against God's truth and God's man again. Moses is born just like God had said. God said, I'll send you a deliverer and I'll lead you out. Now the deliverer comes and Moses comes down there and says, I'm your deliverer. I, he thought they'd understand. They understood not. What did they say? Verse 27, But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Are they resisting the Holy Ghost? Yes. How are they doing it? By resisting God's man, Moses. He's the deliverer. And they say, Who made you a judge or ruler over us? Are they throwing themselves against God's truth? Yes, they most certainly are. All right, let's see. Are they messing up God's plan? Verse 30, And when 40 years was expired, and I'll, let me ask you, look up here. Do you believe that God's program was delayed 40 years by their action? Huh? I just throw that out as a rhetorical question. When 40 years were expired, they appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. There appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. There's the burning bush. Moses is out of Egypt on the backside of Mizian's desert. I bet he thought he'd never see Egypt or Israel again. He had 40 years to say, you know, uh, God was going to make me a deliverer, but I guess they resisted and messed up God's plan. The voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers. Look at there. Tying him back in with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses trembled. God said, put the shoes from off of your feet. And look at verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. I have heard their groanings and then come down to deliver them. They told Abraham 400 years before, when they're down there 400 years, I'm going to send you a deliverer and I'll bring you up and they'll worship me in this place. Didn't it? They resisted. In throwing themselves against Jacob, they resisted in throwing themselves against God, they resisted in throwing themselves against Moses. But God said, I've heard the groanings, and now I will send thee into Egypt. And now, look, even Moses refuses. He got his excuses, you see. But God says in verse 36, He brought them out. You see that? Did they mess up God's plan? Did they change his intention? For who hath resisted his will? Are they throwing themselves? Are they willingly cooperating with God's will? Well, of course they're not. No more than sinners do today. 
They are foolishly throwing themselves against God. Are they changing God's program? It wouldn't seem so from this, would it? And this is the context of the message where he says, You do always throw yourself against the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Are you seeing how their fathers did? He brought them out after they had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and in the wilderness. And he not only brought them out, if we read further, we'd find that through Joshua, he brought them in and they ended up in that land where God said they would. Now while Moses had them out there in the wilderness, did they resist? I'll tell you they did. If you know your Old Testament, they did. They got out there uh, and Moses went up to get the law in Mount Sinai. They hadn't been out there so long. What'd they do? They came to Aaron and said, you know, we don't know what's happened to this Moses fella. He's gone. Pastor went off to revival meeting. We're going to get us a new leader. Don't know what happened to him. Make us gods. And they made a golden calf and they fell down and worshipped him, didn't they? Were they throwing themselves against God and against his oracles and against his truth? Yes. Did they change God's plan? Brother, they stood after all in Canaan's land. Just exactly where God said they would stand. For who hath resisted his will? That is his intention, his decreed purpose is not resisted, not stood against. No man, no group of men, no race of men can keep back what almighty God has decreed to come to pass. And if you don't see that there... I don't think you're reading Acts chapter 7 with me. And it says in this very context that he said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Now why do we want to take that up and run off with it as if it weren't right here in this chapter, you see? But the fact of the matter is that it's right here in this chapter. Let me show you something else. God had said to Israel that Christ should come of that nation. Look at verse 37 here in this chapter. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel. Now he said this by divine inspiration. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear. Did they resist the Holy Ghost? Did they resist his truth and his oracles and his prophets? Yes. Stephen could say, which of these prophets haven't you stoned? They all spoke of Christ and they stoned them, don't you see? Did they frustrate God's purpose? He said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses, and the just one is going to come of Israel, not of another nation, but of Israel. He's going to come in the fullness of time. Well, look down at verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after, brought in with Jesus, or Joshua there, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the day of David. Now, whose son was Christ according to the flesh? David's. Of course he was. He is of the house and lineage of David. All right, so the, the nation survived all of the resistance until David, because God had said to Moses, I'm going to raise a prophet up, like unto you, out of the house of David, and David comes along... Did they resist David? Did they resist Solomon? Did they resist so as that God had to drive them out of the land? Yes. First the ten northern tribes, then Judah went into Babylonian captivity. But you know what? According to the prophecy of Daniel, God got those Israelites regathered back into the land so that when the fullness of time was come, in spite of Israel's apostasy and her idolatry and the fact that she was so resisting that God drove her out of the land, when God's time got ready, Israel was back in the land and he could send the Holy Spirit down to Mary of the house of David and could conceive in her womb of the Holy Ghost this prophet who was like unto Moses. And he arranged with Caesar to have a taxing take place so that they would leave from Nazareth where they were living and go down to Bethlehem where the prophet said Christ was going to be born. Did they throw themselves against God's will? Did they resist the truth and the messengers? Did they resist the oracles of God? Yes. Did they defeat or frustrate God's purpose? 
No, in case it's news to you, Christ was born right on time. He was a prophet like unto Moses. He was born of the house of David. He was born in Bethlehem. And there was a spiritual Israel that heard him and is still hearing him. As your fathers did, so do you. Are men still doing this today? Yes, they are. Ministers of the gospel may be resisted. I read in Acts chapter 13 and verse 8. Elymas did this. As Paul preached, he withstood them. The truth of God may be resisted. We find that Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 8... These are men of corrupt truth who resist the truth. He said there to Elymas in Acts chapter 13 and verse 10, he said, you're perverting the truth of God. And he was. You say, may ministers of the gospel still be resisted? Yes. You may resist me. You may resist what I teach and what I preach. But may you resist the purpose and intention of God. You won't get that job done any more than Israel did. Or any more than Elymas did. For he was blinded and his resistance came to an end. He threw himself against the truth to his own destruction. Did it stop the gospel? Did Paul say, well now I'm sorry. I didn't know that preaching was going to cause opposition. I think I'll just go home. I'm sorry Mr. Elymas. No, he wasn't quite of that temperament was he? I'm not too much of that temperament myself. Resistance is sort of like saying sick him to a dog to me. I don't, I don't like it. I'd rather everybody agree with me and love me like my mother did, but I found out a long time ago they just ain't going to do it. And Abraham Lincoln said, you're not going to chop wood without uh, having some chips. And it's true. I found it to be true. But my friend, let me tell you this. It is not a light matter to resist a God-called, gospel-preaching minister of the gospel. You may do it, but that is no light sin. You will throw yourself against such a minister to your own destruction. I don't say whether it's me or some other. But we stand in Christ's stead beseeching men to be reconciled to God, and you'd better be careful how you play fast and loose with God's men. Whether that preacher be myself or some other man. Men may resist the truth, and, and God's ministers... I find in Romans chapter 13, verse 2, that men may resist human magistrates who are God's ordinances. But again, to their own destruction. We ought to keep the laws of the land because they are as ordinances of God. And to resist them is to resist God. Men may do this. They may reject God's counsel for themselves. Luke chapter 7 and verse 30. Let's look back there just a minute. I want you to see this verse. Jesus had just got through saying in this chapter, just to bring you up with the context. He was talking about John the Baptist, and he said, Of all those born of women, there's none greater than John. When he said that, all the people, even the tax collectors, they began to justify God because they were baptized with, with the baptism of John. Verse 29, But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. What was that counsel or advice that God gave? When he came to be baptized of John, what did he do? He stuck out his hand and said, I'll Just sign here on the dotted line, you'll become a member of my church. He looked at them and said, You generation of snakes... Who warns you to flee the wrath to come? Bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. And then you may talk to me about baptism. But as you are in your sin and your unbelief and your hypocrisy, get away from here. And they rejected the counsel of God against themselves. They threw themselves against it all their life. They weren't satisfied until John was dead. And then they threw themselves against our blessed Lord until they had him crucified. But let me ask you, did they frustrate God's purpose in John the Baptist? Not in your life. Did they frustrate God's purpose in Christ? We're going to consider that more particularly in a moment. 
men may throw themselves against the Holy Ghost, against its ministers, against its truth, against the gospel, against the counsel of God, against themselves, and thus they oppose themselves. That, that phrase is used twice over in the English Bible. Men oppose themselves when they resist God's truth. They oppose themselves when they resist God's ministers. They oppose themselves when they resist God's ordinances. They oppose themselves when they resist God's counsel. But they do not change that counsel any more than these Pharisees did. God did not change his mind about them when they did that. They were still a bunch of snakes. It's interesting. If you don't believe me, check it out. I told you that in Acts chapter 7 here, you do always resist. That's to throw yourself against. The word that Paul used in Romans 9 is to stand against so as to withhold God's purpose. Men are said to stand against God's truth and God's ministers and God's oracles. But you can search this Bible through, my friend, and you'll not find one place where any human being is said to stand against Almighty God directly, either Father, Son, or Holy Ghost. Because that's an impossibility. Mortals are not capable of doing that. And you say, why aren't they? Because God is God and mortals are mortal. That's why. Well, what about the matter of Christ's personal rejection? He's God. All right, let's consider that for just a moment. In doing so, turn to Matthew 23. By the way, you kids down here are being very good. And I appreciate it. And the rest of you aren't doing so bad. Verse 37, here is Jesus Christ. The prophet likened to Moses. He's come with the seed of David, being born of the virgin, just exactly the way God said he would. He's presented himself to this earthly nation of Israel. They reject him. As they had said to Moses long ago, who made you to be a ruler or a judge over us? That's exactly what they said to this prophet likened to Moses. And they said, who says you're the Messiah? And they rejected him. They resisted him and threw themselves against him, all of his ministry. And finally, they publicly will reject him and say, let him be crucified. They'll take him out to Golgotha and put him to a tree. And here the Messiah stands and looks over Jerusalem and says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets. Sounds almost like Stephen, doesn't it? Which of the prophets haven't your father stoned? You do resist as your fathers did. All right. Thou that killest the prophets. And stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together? Notice it says thy children. Why thy children rather than them themselves? Did you ever notice that there? He didn't say I'll gather you, but your children. Even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. You would not that your children should be gathered under my wings. Now that's a different matter than their being gathered themselves, wouldn't you say? This is about 33 AD. Do you know what happened to their children? Do you know what befell Jerusalem in 70 AD? About 40 years afterwards to their children? The Roman general led his legions against Jerusalem. There in that city where they said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. They besieged that city until women were eating their own children. And finally the city was broken up and they crucified Jews. The children of these that Jesus weeps over. And where they crucified one Messiah... The Romans crucified Jews so that their crosses made an unbroken circle all the way around that city. And Jesus is standing here weeping. How often would I have gathered your children? But you would not. Now what is going to be the result? Rather than their children being gathered, they're crucified. 
And Josephus, the Jewish historian, says so much blood was shed that it rushed down the streets like rivers into homes and put out fireplaces. Did they throw themselves against the prophet of God? Yes. To their own terrible destruction and that of their children. For they said, let his blood be on us and on our children, didn't they? I wonder why they said that. And Jesus said, I would have gathered thy children together. And he said, behold, your house is left in you desolate. And has it not been so? For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they haven't said that yet. You say, they're back in their city, and they are. They're back in their land, in all the unbelief and desolation spiritually that you can imagine. You say, what's going to happen to their children? The only thing that can happen to them until they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Further desolation, destruction, misery, and woe. It's never been any different. No wonder he weeps. What Jerusalem was this? The one where the prophets were, and yet they stoned the prophets. The one where King David once reigned, and yet the greater son of David is rejected. But, though they received this call nationally, and nationally they could have been spared that terrible desolation had they received the Messiah. But I want to ask you that know your Bible and have an open Bible for you. The Jews in rejecting Christ and crucifying him, did they frustrate or mess up God's intention? Turn over the book of Acts. We were over there a minute ago. At chapter 4. I don't know why people won't look into the scriptures and, and seek an, uh, an exposition of scripture. Like I say, scripture will explain itself if you give it an opportunity to. Verse 27 of this chapter. Here the early church is on its knees before God. And I want you to see what they're praying to God. For of a truth. Against. Did you notice? Against thy holy child Jesus. Whom thou hast anointed. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles. And the people of Israel were gathered together. What were they doing? Early Christians. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Is that in your Bible that way? Did they resist the Holy Ghost? Yes. Just like their fathers did, they did. They threw themselves against even the Messiah of God. Did they mess up God's program? They only did what? God's hand and counsel determined before to be done. Peter said the same thing in Acts chapter 22, verse uh, 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now that's there. How then do men resist the Holy Ghost? Do they frustrate God's purposed and predestinated intentions? We've seen here from this chapter in this context that at, that absolutely is denied and Stephen never thought for a moment to teach that. Now, why do people go around preaching that that's what he said, and they use his very words? And I'll tell you what, when they do, they are guilty of usurping the truth of God and twisting it to their own destruction. And they are not guiltless. And I care not if some of you have done it. You're guilty before a holy God. That is not the truth of Scripture. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The human Messiah was once subjected to shame. He was once made subject to the rejection of men. They put Christ on a block and allowed a Roman governor to come out and say, Which of these will you have? Barabbas or Christ? Because they were only doing what God's hand had determined and his counsel had said before was going to be done. It was necessary, Jesus said. It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the Pharisees and by the high priests and by the scribes and be killed 
and be raised on the third day. That was necessary. Let me tell you, they could stand there that day and they could cry out with all the hatred and venom of their souls, let them be crucified. And they did crucify him. And they put him in a tomb. And had they had the power, they'd have kept him there. But he also must be raised again on the third day. Why? Because of what men will do and because of their resistance? No, my friend, but because of God's eternal intention, whom none can resist. And he came forth. And when he had commissioned his church, he went yonder to the right hand of the Father. And then Peter told some of those same Jews in that first sermon preached. He concludes it by saying this. Are you listening? And I wish some of the modern evangelists and so-called preachers of the gospel were listening too. Who again put Christ on this low level and say, here he is, an ignominian shame. Reject him or accept him. Peter said, let the whole house of Israel assuredly know that God hath made the same Jesus, the one that you rejected and the one that you spat upon, the one you crucified. He's made the same Jesus both Lord and Christ. And they're not going to spit on him again. And they're not going to defile him again. Neither the Jews, nor Pontius Pilate, nor Herod, nor all the haters of truth, though they throw themselves against him, they do it to their own destruction. Yes, they're going to do it. But my friend, he's enthroned forever, and he's there at that right hand until all enemies are made his footstool. And when he comes back again, it's without a sin offering, the writer of the book of Hebrews says. And he appears in glory, taking fiery vengeance upon those that obey not the truth. Read Second Thessalonians chapter 1. He is not again, and never has been, nor will he ever be, put into that humiliation of rejection again. I hope this will clarify, for it is, I believe, a faithful exposition of what a person may resist and how he may resist the Holy Ghost and also how he may not. Who hath resisted, who has stood against so as to impede or hinder God's will? That is his intended purpose, Paul would say in Romans chapter 9 and verse 19. Any of God's will of intention or decreed purpose will not be resisted by man or anybody else. God's chosen course of history will not be resisted. You believe that? That's kind of weak. Or maybe you think things are just running wild. You don't know how it may turn out. God and the devil are in a fist fight, and you're just sitting on the sideline waiting to see who's going to win. Is that your concept of history? That your concept of the divine course of things? Then you'd better read chapter 4 of Daniel, verses 34 and 35, where Daniel says that God does as he pleases in the armies of the heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say to him, God, what are you doing? Or why are you doing? You'll find that's in your Bible, too. God's chosen course of the gospel cannot be resisted. Now, I'm glad that's true. I'm glad that sinners are at the mercy of God, and God is not at the mercy of sinners. Jesus said before he was crucified, Matthew 16, 18, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You believe that? Why is that true? Because God said it would be true. That's why. Do men throw themselves against the church? Yes. Do they throw themselves against the truth? I tell you, there's a whole lot of folks alive in this generation and have been in every generation. They'd love to do away with the church of Jesus Christ, but they ain't going to get the job done. We've got divine protection, brother. I look out, you know, there are a lot of forces arrayed against us today. And I speak just not of our particular church, but of any real gospel preaching church. I look at half the world and more dominated by... Marxian communism. And they say that religion of any kind is only the opiate of the people. And the preachers ought to be the first to have their throats cut. And after that, all church members. Does that worry you any? 
others in places of high authority in our very government, if they had the opportunity to close us down and date it yesterday. Does that worry you any, honey? Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God's course of the gospel and the effectual, powerful call of the Spirit to salvation is not effectually and forever resisted. For God has said in Psalm 110, verse 3, My people shall be willing in the day of my power. And when God calls, when He gives forth that effectual call, oh, the sinner may throw himself against it, he may even for a time resist, but my friend, when God, who has elected an individual from before all eternity and has sent his son to die for him, when the Holy Spirit sets out to save that person, the Holy Spirit's going to get the job done. Amen. And you can believe it. And that doesn't make me fatalistic or cold-hearted, brother. That makes me burn with love to see more of it done and accomplished. Amen. But that that is true beyond all question, I say, bless God, that's true. For you see your calling, brethren. And whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And listen to it. Whom he called, them he also justified. It doesn't say part of them. Jesus said, of his sheep, for whom he laid down his life, I'll raise them up at the last day. I'll raise them up at the last day. And Paul also put glorification in there. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. And we shall belong to the Lord. Men will not resist the day of redemption or the day of wrath. There is a day of redemption coming. We're bought. We're under His blood. We're on our way to glorification. But I look at myself and I'm not quite glorified yet, are you? I see a lot of imperfections and sin. I look at the world and it makes me groan. Because I'm under bondage. But the day of redemption is coming, isn't it? The world will resist it. A lot of Christians resist it. But brother, the day of the Lord will come. Make no mistake about it. It'll come right in God's own good time when he said it'd come. Not one second late and not one second too soon. And the day of wrath will come. Christ taking fiery vengeance on those that believe not the truth. And obey not the gospel of God. You may throw yourself against it. Remember, you will do it to your own destruction. And I'll tell you something else that won't be resisted by man either. When God sets up his great white throne, though the heaven and the earth seek to flee from the face of him that sitteth on that throne, they won't be able to. And the books will be open, and the dead, small and great, will stand before God. And brother, you'll be there. And when God says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, and the everlasting fire, you won't resist that either. And you will be cast into eternal Men would resist all those things if they could. But though it's true of too many, you do always resist, throw yourself against the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so did you. You may resist God's truth. I have an idea some of you are. You may resist God's ministers. You are and have and maybe will continue to. You may resist God's ordinances. But my friend, you will not resist that hour when God calls you into account. And you'd better flee the wrath to come. And it's coming. And you'd better make your peace with God. For you are shut up to God's mercy. And whatever you may think, you're not in the driver's seat. But you know, I'm glad I'm not. Some people would rather be. I wouldn't rather be. My friends, if I know my heart, if I could change it, I would. If I could take and usurp God's power, I would not. For God's doing it right. I like the way he's running the show. I think he's doing it properly and in infinite wisdom and grace and love. And whatsoever he does is just perfectly fine with this poor sinner saved by grace. And if you're ever to be saved, you're dependent on God's mercy. 
And brother, that is the strongest motive I know to seek the Lord while he may be found, and to call upon him. You're helpless and powerless before the wrath and indignation of a just and holy God. Oh, why wouldn't you call out and sue for peace and mercy before a God like that? And you have all sorts of offers of mercy and of grace proffered to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you resist, my friend, you do it to your own destruction. You're not going to change God's program one iota.